Greenwood would never be what it was. Uh, but it can certainly be more than what it is. And that's going to take a collective effort uh, to accomplish that. Uh, now, how, how do we go about accomplishing that is, is a task uh, in itself because uh, we're in 2021 or 2020 or 2019 or in the 2000s, and whenever we started this effort. Uh, and uh, uh, the climate, things are different now. Different in a sense that, you know, we talk about equity, we talk about uh, justice and injustices, uh, we talk about equal opportunities. Uh, well, if we're going to uh, talk the talk, uh, uh, we need to walk the walk. Ninety-nine years later, where almost a hundred years ago, six people had airplanes, 31 grocery stores, 21 restaurants. We had uh, movie theaters. We we had hotels that were black-owned, and uh, and 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 with what we watch in the news today, uh, you know, when when people portray black folks as only people that go to jail for uh, things that are now legal, uh, incarceration levels uh, exploded in this state, where entrepreneurism and the spirit of, of economic independence is what we were, it's what we have in our DNA, and I want to see that again, and I think that telling this story and bringing people here and creating these economic opportunities is the way to address it. I've been here for nearly 25 years. Uh, I was here when we had our 75th year commemoration, and I'll be here when we have the 100 year commemoration. And over that time span, I've had the opportunity to meet um, and interact with many of the survivors who have since passed. I was able to hear them tell their stories and see them seek reparations. And although reparations um, they never received reparations. One of the things that they said was most important to them was that their children and grandchildren finally know the rich history of the Greenwood District, that they know their history as successful business owners, savvy business owners, that they know about how much they loved their community and they loved one another, how resilient and proud and courageous they were. So for me, while those survivors have passed, I feel that I have a responsibility to continue to tell their story. Black Wall Street, it is like uh, going viral. And that's a term that you, if you Google, it just comes up. One of the most Google items. But a lot of people don't know it's Greenwood and it's in uptown slash downtown Tulsa. There is energy that is still here from uh, the massacre that um, it, I don't want this to be a like, paranormal type of thing. But however, um, there is energy that lingers that uh, you can tell that there are uh, entities that are really attracted to the positivity and um, not so much to the negativity. And so for me as a business owner, uh, what I try to do is just do really good business and, and, and expand. When we came in 2011, the ballpark was relatively new. Um, there was a lot of energy that, that Greenwood was going to, to soon be folded into this urban growth that the Arts District was experiencing, the Blue Dome District, and it was moving this way. Um, but, but Greenwood itself, 
is is culturally distinct and um, and there wasn't just the flow of that traffic coming onto Greenwood the recognition that this is a unique uh, somewhat sacred land that it it hasn't found a way to prosper economically because it represents such profound grief that it hasn't been embraced um, even though that time is is due to be on this historic avenue like People don't understand today because they weren't alive during the heyday of Black Wall Street, a lot of them during the 1920s. Um, but Greenwood Avenue was like the Rodeo Drive of Beverly Hills. Uh, it was like the Wall Street of New York. It was like the Beale Street of Memphis. It was like the Auburn Avenue of Atlanta. It, it, it was the street that everything was on. To have this church on Greenwood Avenue to, to be the oldest continuous landowner on Greenwood. Like nobody has owned their land on Greenwood or in the Greenwood district longer than Vernon has owned hers. Nobody. We've owned this parcel of land since 1908. And that, I, I, that still gives me chills. I grew up on Greenwood. You know, the one we had one rule when I was a child. Don't let anyone call me and tell me you were doing something wrong. And so we could go anywhere and we were all up and down Greenwood. We sold eagles across the street to make money. You know, we found pop bottles and sold them. And we just grew up and I guess growing up here, it's it's common, it's common. Whereas when I left and went to the military, everybody was, wow, you, you, you were on Greenwood? And they would talk about Greenwood like it was all of this and all of that. And to me, it was just my neighborhood. So, you know, I grew up here and I seen all the changes. When at one time it was businesses, I was told at one time it was at least 40% of all black people in North Tulsa owned the business. Now it's like 5%. Theaters, nightclubs, variety stores, you name it. Pool hall, recreation, man. Now it's one block. So when I remember it and recall, there's a hurt for feeling because I know what it has been and can never be again.
Greenwood in 1921 was a pretty rapidly growing place, as was all of Tulsa. It was known as one of the most prosperous uh, black communities in the country. And there were uh, some very uh, uh, nice middle-class neighborhoods in Greenwood. There were also some pretty uh, poor neighborhoods. In 1920, 21, in that era, uh, there were really two different standards. Uh, a, uh, an African-American could work really hard, uh, succeed, and if they were really lucky, they achieved what we would think of today as the middle class. A young black uh, fella and a young white woman who was operating the uh, elevator had some kind of uh, con uh, contact on the elevator. When the elevator got to the first floor, she, well, she screamed on the elevator. When the elevator got to the first floor, the, the young black fella took off running. He's identified as Dick Rowland. And so that happened on May 30th. The next morning on May 31st, the police arrested him and brought him in. So he was in the city jail, which was down at uh, uh, Second and uh, uh, Main down here. The uh, the police commissioner, a man named Atkinson, said he got a telephone call saying we're gonna we're gonna get this guy. So they decided to move him to the county jail, which is at was at Sixth and Boulder, and uh, and it was a much more secure place. It was on the top floor of the courthouse, and uh, it was virtually impregnable. And so uh, so they moved him there and uh, people started kind of uh, congregating around the courthouse. And it, I have to say it's not exactly clear why most of the what most of the people's uh, people who were there, what their intent was. You have to keep in mind at this time there was no radio, there's no television, there's no news helicopters. If you want to see what's going on, you have to go there in person. So in all likelihood, a lot of those people were just there to see what was going on. But at any rate, uh, this crowd kept getting bigger and bigger, and the word began to sit, circulate in Greenwood that they were that there was going to be a lynching, that they were going to kill Dick Rowland. We soon had uh, some number of black men going to the courthouse, armed to protect Dick Rowland, and this was a pretty. Uh, um, radical step. Today, uh, this would have, you know, we would have had all kinds of police, National Guard, all of that stuff out there to, to stop what was going on. In those days, you had the sheriff and his black deputy out in front of the courthouse trying to tell everybody to go home. And, um, you know, the black men went home a couple of times, but the whites would not leave. And so eventually the black men came for a final time, uh, there was a scuffle over a gun. The gun went off, and at that point, uh, the, the, the riot part of all of this started. And it was in downtown Tulsa, and, and uh, it was basically white people chasing the, the black people out of downtown Tulsa, and, and uh, the, uh, the black people retreated into Greenwood. And over the, over the night of May 31st and June 1st, there was just kind of a gun battle across across the railroad tracks that separated white Tulsa from black Tulsa. Uh, the National Guard, uh, there were probably about 35 of them went in and started um, taking into, into custody any uh, black people they could. Uh, a lot of black people fled, most of them to the north. And then there were some black people who put up a fight and, and, uh, and they were, shot. You know, I mean, there were some gun battles. But at some point, Greenwood was pretty much cleared out. Then these arson squads came in and burned it to the ground. 35 square blocks gone in a matter of hours. By 11 or 12 o'clock on June the 1st, Greenwood was pretty much a pile of smoking rubble.
It's important to understand American history and understand that what happened in Tulsa in 1921 was really emblematic of the kind of racial violence and historical racial trauma that was happening in the United States more generally. Having said that, uh, Tulsa had reportedly the worst outbreak of racial violence in terms of what was described as a race riot. What's often unreported uh, and sometimes underreported uh, is the fact that the community, as a business community, revived um, after the devastation and peaked as a business community as Black Wall Street in the early to mid 1940s. After that peak in the, in the 40s, the community was sustained for a number of years and then began to decline in the 60s, 70s, and 80s on account of urban renewal, integration, and other social, political, and economic factors. Today in the community, it's an integrated community. The biggest landowner in the community is the city of Tulsa, Tulsa Development Authority. Uh, one of the other large landowners in the community is Oklahoma State University Tulsa campus. So it's a community that is essentially an amalgam of different kinds of interests, residential, commercial, educational, entertainment, cultural, and religious. I forever call myself the grateful pastor of historic Vernon Edmund Church because I'm eternally grateful to God to pastor a historical icon. Vernon um, started in 1905 and, um, on Detroit Avenue. In 1906, we came over here to Greenwood, went to first Gurley Hall. Then we went to a building on Archer. Then we purchased some land and built our first sanctuary on Archer. Um, and then in 1908, came here and built our first sanctuary on Greenwood. Um, and we've been home, we've been at, we've been on 307-311 uh, North Greenwood. Um, over time, we purchased more land, so now we start we start with 309, then went to 308, then 307, then 310, then 311, and so we own 307 to 311. Um, and we've been here uh, since 1908, and we're the oldest thing, we're the oldest continuous landowner period in the Greenwood District. Nobody has owned their land. Uh, in this district longer than we have. And um, we have seen the rise, the destruction, re the rebuild, and the demise of the historic Black Wall Street area. Um, in 1919, we built our basement. 1921, we were building this sanctuary that was destroyed during the massacre. Uh, but miraculously, the basement survived. And uh, it is the only thing we still have now from the Black Wall Street era on Greenwood that's still here. After urban renewal, we call it urban removal, when they, after they built the interstate highway through here and they purchased up all the land, our church never has rebounded since, you know, because it used to be a time people could walk across the street to come to the church. Now, no houses, like you see outside, no homes, you know. And that is sad. And so today, uh, we are a shell of our former self. In our heyday, we had over a thousand plus members. This was back in the 20s and 30s. Um, today, we are under 200 members. We're actually under 150 members. And, um, but we still have that same pride in our history, in our culture, in our heritage. We still worship here every Sunday. This less than 200 member church um, that has an operating budget of, like last year we raised $200,000 for the whole year, it's just 200. Um, but God blessed us to be able to provide for all those in need. Um, so this is a truly remarkable place um, that believes in ministry. Even while our edifice is in need of being, rest, being, being restored, right? Our church um, is, Oh, it's historic. Um, and being historic includes maintenance. I'm the second longest tenant here now. You know, so it's just different people coming and different going different businesses you know there was once a hat store here there was shoe stores 
and just all kinds of businesses that come and go. The Greenwood that I know was in the 50s and the 60s and the early 70s. Now, when it comes to looking and seeing uh, the destruction, that's the destruction I have in my mind where this uh, expressway come through and cut off the head of Greenwood. This, this was called Deep End, Deep End, Deep Greenwood. And once they, once they started the construction on that, the rest of the Greenwood crumbled. And that, when I see destruction, I don't see the, you know, the 1921. I see 1970. When I was probably 20 years old, I remember coming in here and they danced up in this area, okay? And in the back, I wasn't supposed to go in the back because I was only 20 at 21. I may have been 21 by then, but I came here at 20 years old. But they'd gamble in the back. So the old man told me, don't go to Deep Greenwood. Somebody will kill you. See, I was told you was down there the other night. And I said, what you doing? I said, I was dancing, looking around. I said, you dance somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> at 20 years old, you know, you got a lot of energy. I want to see everything. So yeah, it was a club here, and I think it was the Bonneville Club. When we came here and opened Tees, we had left T. Compsey's barbershop. Mr. Compsey said, if you guys want to go down to Deep Greenwood, they've renovated that center, and we call it a million dollar square. I said, is it going to have air conditioning and good lighting? He didn't want to tell me, he said, yes. I said, then I'll go. He said, it's going to cost you more money. I said, well, I'll pay a little money to have a little more luxury. So we moved in. When we came here, we were the first business that I could remember to come in here, other than the Oklahoma Eagle may have used a little space due to a burnout or something in their building. But we moved in in 85. Very few businesses here, very slow. We were very angry because we got moved around due to what they call, uh, uh, they, go, they go into it and call it uh, eminent domain. So they went in and they called it eminent domain. They tore buildings down. It was buildings up in the 1100 block, the 1000 block, and places like that up there that I thought should have been salvaged. They should have been able to remodel them or something. It's been a blessing. We've had some hard times. I was very angry when they put that baseball stadium in because, I, you know, I like football and basketball. And I figured baseball was just going to... And I didn't want to see nothing like what I'd seen on 15th Street. But when they finished, all while they were building it, I was angry because people would walk in and I, we had carpets over there and they'd bring in black tar off the street blacking up our carpets and so forth. But anyway, make a long story short, <clears throat> when they finished with the, with this part, since it was a state of the art and they said it was $25 million, I said, I don't know how we can afford to stay here, but we're going to stay in Reuben Gant. said, Willie, I said, you're going to raise my rent. He said, Willie, we're not going to raise your rent. If your rent's going to stay the same, you'll be all right. It's been a challenge in terms of um, redeveloping Greenwood or let's say uh, creating an environment that is part of Main Street America. Uh, uh, you know, interestingly enough, I mean, I was born and raised here and uh, I've been working with uh, the Greenwood area, the Greenwood district since the mid 1980s. And I would, uh, run across uh, individuals that were native Tulsans uh, and uh, they would ask me where I work, what do I do, uh, what am I involved with, and I would mention Greenwood. Well, this perplexion would come over their faces, wondering, well, Greenwood, where, where is that? And uh, I would have to use landmarks um, to identify the area. So I would use OSU Tulsa as a landmark. And I'd say, well, do you know where OSU Tulsa is? Oh, yeah, <clears throat> we know that it is. Well, that's in the heart of the Greenwood District. Oh, and so uh, what 
uh, I chose to do and what my board chose to do early on when uh, there was talk of relocating a baseball diamond somewhere downtown. Uh, we were approached uh, by uh, the city uh, to uh, consider allowing this ballpark to be built uh, in the Greenwood area. Uh, and that was very contentious at the time because uh, the community itself uh, felt like this was holy ground and uh, didn't really want a ballpark built here. But I felt it was an inherent uh, marketing opportunity uh, to create visibility for the area uh, at the same time to uh, expose the city to its own history. The risk was taken to build a ballpark here. Well, after the ballpark opened, um, uh, it created uh, pedestrian traffic of well over half a million people a year, uh, which was a successful marketing opportunity for us uh, because uh, I would sit in my office um, as the president of the Greenwood Chamber and uh, just notice the uh, traffic going up and down the sidewalks. Well, in the sidewalks on Greenwood, and one of the things we did, or I did, was um, to um, have a gateway uh, to the ballpark entrance on Greenwood. And that's so people would have to walk down Greenwood and pass our uh, merchants store fronts on Greenwood. We have plaques in the sidewalks. And those plaques identify the location of businesses uh, that were burned or destroyed during the 1921 massacre. And so I would notice people walking up and down the street. Uh, and they would walk up and down the street with their heads down. Well, they were reading the plaques in the street. Uh, so I thought, mm, that's working. The future looks bright for the Greenwood District. There are a number of projects and initiatives that are taking place, and I believe in five to 10 years, the Greenwood uh, District will um, have went through this renaissance where we will see new businesses open, new development um, that is taking place. And so we are excited about what the future holds for the Greenwood District and for the Greenwood Cultural Center. Our purpose in part is to provide positive images of the African American community, to provide a place where our children can come and learn about their history and learn and explore different forms of the arts. And one of the most important things that we do is to create um, exhibits and archive photographs and share that information um, as it is related to the history of the Greenwood District. When Booker T. Washington came here, he had been to Harlem, he had been to Memphis in particular, Chicago, and he looked at this place and said, this is uh, the Black Wall Street. This is like the best place for African-Americans in this country. And so we just want a little touch of that. We, if you go to Bill Street, we want a little touch of Bill Street. We want live action. We want some community involvement. We want uh, live music. We want more restaurants. We want more foot traffic. We want better lighting at night so people can walk around and just explore. And uh, and to be honest with you, we don't want to green. When people think of Greenwood, we don't want them to always think of the Tulsa Race Massacre. We want them to think about how you can be resilient, how you can make lemonade out of lemons, and how you can just have fun, enjoying life, because uh, that's what American experience is all about. We have roughly 30 businesses and a very diverse pool of businesses. Uh, however, there is a key fact here. 80% uh, of our businesses are led by African-American females, which is uh, an amazing fact. Uh, we have uh, insurance agencies, we have uh, uh, large restaurants, uh, uh, we have uh, natural health clinics, uh, real estate agencies, a barbershop, uh, two beauty salons. It's just, uh, we have uh, authors, a uh, lawyer's office, accounting firm. We have a different uh, arrangement of businesses here. Uh, 
that meets the needs of the Tulsa Greenwood area. Just being here and upholding this legacy, and I try to do everything that I do in excellence because when I look at um, our ancestors, when they came, they were people of excellence. And it's awesome, you know, it's awesome as you look at the history. Um, the majority of the business folks weren't from Tulsa. <laughs> they migrated from other parts of the country. And, um, you know, it's funny because they represented the United States where folks come in and bring the different talents and, and turn it into a really great, awesome place. It's like three components of opening up the lock shop was to honor the ancestors um, um, and uphold their legacy. Also uh, bringing black businesses back to Greenwood um, and also um, a launching board for other uh, stylists to come in, not to come in to stay, but to come in and um, pick up different business practices for myself and um, later on open up their own shops. People are like, oh wow, you're on Greenwood? That's great. Like, <laughs> they're surprised that, that, you know, a real estate company would be here. And to me, this is like prime real estate. I feel like still it's very much, you know, undervalued um, by, by Tolson's and um, just overall. Um, but I'm hoping that in the next few years, you know, people will start to see the beauty of this place. I honestly hadn't, well, I knew a little bit about the history of Black Wall Street, but not that much because it was never taught in schools. Um, I've gone to college, I've gone to grad school, it's never taught in schools. Um, but maybe a few years back, before I moved to Tulsa, um, my husband and I started talking about Black Wall Street because his mom always taught him about black history that's not often taught in schools. Um, so just being here, we learned a little bit more. Um, and it was kind of a very interesting experience. Um, and at the same time, it seemed like overall across the country, people were starting to talk about this place more at the same time. Um, so I'm just very happy you know, to be here, especially in this moment. I met Marvin and he was uh, retiring from, T uh, from TPD and working with TPS and his children uh, were at Booker T and it was then that we, we bonded over a love of collage. And <laughs> I love collage, he loves collage. You could call it whatever you want, you could call it scrapbooking, you could call it whatever you want, but uh, when he passed in 2016, his family um, left his collection of collages to uh, the chamber and um, in hopes that they would be displayed in some capacity and, and a series of events <laughs> led me to uh, here and I, I believe that everyone who's involved in uh, supporting and rebuilding and restoring and Greenwood rising, Black Wall Street rising uh, is doing that work. The reason Greenwood existed as a black business community is because the people in the community couldn't actively participate in the dominant economy of t the city of Tulsa. They created their so own separate enclave uh, adjacent to downtown across the Frisco tracks of what, what, what became known as the Greenwood District and, and Black Wall Street. So. Greenwood really is the result of what I, what I call an economic detour. In other words, the people in the community were not able to fully engage with the economy of the city of Tulsa, created a kind of separate economy, but still were dependent on the city of Tulsa for things like infrastructure, sewer, roads, and really got an unfair shake in that regard as well. One of the things that's happened of late, relatively, in a historical sense, is the city government of Tulsa changed from city commission, which is an at-large system, to a city council form of government. So that all sectors of the community, all geographic sectors, actually get represented in the city government and then are able to make decisions about things like infrastructure and so on. We know that because of this is the only district that's the buildings that's left, we, we can't get 
what we had back. But to get some semblance of that and to show people, to be able to, the museum that's coming, to be able to show people what it was like back then. And with the ball, the addition of the ballpark, uh, the museum coming, the things that we are having, uh, that we like to see happen in these buildings, uh, more people uh, coming and uh, joining the Greenwood uh, Chamber experience. That's what I want to see. I want to see growth happen within this to expand on out all the way to back to Pine even. I think within the last few years, we've seen um, the Greenwood Chamber of Commerce in the Greenwood District become more active and recruit more businesses. Within the last few years, they've had um, nearly a dozen new businesses open in the Greenwood District. So people, uh, entrepreneurs are gaining access to the resources that they need and are choosing to uh, open their businesses in the historic Greenwood District. Not knowing the history of, of Greenwood uh, before I moved here, um, uh, it was something that uh, once I, I did move here, it was just like, wow, this is, this is, uh, this is incredible. You know, this, I, I never knew anything about this before. So, um, so to be successful here on Greenwood actually meant more um, uh, because of the history, the legacy that was here. I, I felt like I had to do the ancestors uh, justice. I have uh, this farmer's insurance agency here on, located on Greenwood, uh, as well as I have a uh, fitness and recreation studio. Um, they do uh, within the um, studio. There's tap, dance, ballet, and also Brazilian jiu-jitsu and music studio. So uh, these are some of the things that I'm I'm doing here currently on Greenwood. I don't, I don't know how it was before, so I can I can only talk about my uh, experience uh, now. Well, at least the last couple years and there's a lot of traffic like there's uh, meaning uh, I've had several interviews a lot of news footage uh, uh, magazines from all across the world have come uh, just to understand what's happening here what's happened here and to get a better idea of, of the neighbor of the climate there's never a dull moment on Greenwood I can I can say that it was a gym out north called the Reed Foundation and I found coach Reed there Within a year, I became a champion. Boxing has done a lot for me personally um, outside of the gym, such as learning how to carry myself and wanting and striving for better things, such as good grades and just better goals in life. And so I was like, well, if boxing can do this for me, then I want to be a coach as well and see if I can change other kids' lives or at least if affect one person, then I know I'm doing something right. Greenwood is historic. Like I said, whenever I first got down here, I didn't know too much about Greenwood, so I had to do my research as well to understand the value of the ground that I'm standing on, you know, and I would try to implement that with my kids, you know, in the middle of training, I'd be like, everybody get down, everybody get down. So they're getting down, they're like, what? I'm like, now what if someone just came in here and just killed all of us? What if they just dropped bombs on us right now? You know, that's what happened back then. So it's not just about black history as well with and learning about Green, Greenwood. But I tell my fighters, you know, you're Hispanic, learn about your culture. You know, Caucasian, learn about your culture, Native American, Chinese, it doesn't matter to me. It's the idea of doing your research, learning about and appreciating where we are right now because there's so much history, you know, and the parents, I think as well, should take more initiative in teaching that to their children. We have a tendency to sometimes uh, drag along the past and we never be able to really grow and move on to the future. And so uh, we're here to, you know, bring, uh, I guess Greenwood up to date, you know, the millennial, you know. Uh, so it's it's a, it's kind of Kiss 22. You know, you don't never forget your history. Then that where you never know where you're going, but also your history can also drag you down if you try to hold on to it. And so I teach the girls, you know, I have six daughters and they all work in the business that you know history is good for learning and but it never projects you you know forward so we have to make sure that we keep moving forward and so i'm here to hopefully bring like i say greenwood up to date i like to see tulsa as a whole 
I'm that type of guy. You, you know, it's as a whole, you know, to be a, 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 a small business mecca like it, it once was. That's my desire. Uh, you know, I'm not so much just concentrated here this itself because it's such a this small area. But it is only gonna be limited to what you can do. And so, you know, so as a whole, I like to see Tulsa with along with downtown, let's say it that way, downtown Tulsa and North Tulsa, East Tulsa, West Tulsa, and South Tulsa as a whole to be a small business mecca for other states to see. When we were coming up with the concept, Guy Troop and I, uh, we was, well, we'll use a, a code word for the shop and Liquid Lounge was the code word that we came up with and it just stuck. And basically, our, our what we are is a social coffee shop. Of course, coffee is the base. Uh, we are interested in selling the medicinal liquids such as roots, uh, teas, and therefore, and then also uh, wine. Uh, we're, we're applying for a liquor license, and wine license later on this, this summer. Because of the 100 year anniversary of the massacre and the attention it has gotten is received over the last 24 months, there's a lot of interest outside of the district, outside of Oklahoma, about this legacy. So, with having said that, that's brought a lot of speculative investors and, and, and people that's interested in seeing that this would be revitalized so that there's a model for the success of this community because there is a Black Wall Street in every major city in America. In Tulsa, we have generations of persons um, of, of all races, but extensive traumatization in the African American and the Native communities. And so a new way was set up here in this vortex um, in the context of significant trauma um, to, uh, to assist with recovery. It begins with an adult who, um, who, um, who brings a child into the world and who has their own traumatic events in their life that they've not recovered from and they don't have the capacity to have the empathy and the, um, the attunement to the emotional needs of their child. And there is a child that then experiences those adverse childhood experiences because the parent um, is using substances or there's domestic violence taking place or they have their own um, pains that they've not dealt with. And then that child experiences. So that's a very common thing that it, that we, we receive the referral because the child is acting out, but in, a, in, but in looking closer, the child is experiencing trauma. But we can't blame the parents because the parents have experienced that trauma as well. So um, to, um, to help the whole family recover from trauma ultimately, to help the whole community recover from trauma is ultimately where we have to move. So what's your world like? Mine is full of melanated children who actually thrive due to a lack of black fear and the absence of an oppressive system where the teachers earn enough to actually call it making a living and where Black Wall Street still flourishes on much more than just the Greenwood District. Where there's not construction on every road in the city where we are kings and queens, not men and women, not to be poor, trade as villains. If you are a victim, this is the world that I live in. This morning, I saw Terrence Crutcher at Donuts with Dad Day. Last night, I watched Trayvon graduate from Florida State. Sandra Bland starts a business, relocates to the Bay. Gives Oscar Grant a job with a great rate of pay. Eric Garner's doing great. Philando Castile is governor in his state. In my world, things have changed. I turn on the TV, I see Gary Payton, Michael Jordan, and LeBron. They going head up with AI, KD, Kobe Bryant. It's game seven, two minutes left, score tied, championship is on the line and everybody's in their prime, but I'm inclined to go with the Mamba. Cause like I, he's from the world's greatest continent, where we're taught to honor our mothers and our fathers. 
their sisters and their brothers, and so I took my head as if to say, hey, auntie, welcome to Wakanda. Sincerely yours, T'Challa, but last name Killmonger. My world different. Cody Ransom. The community thinks there's some hope, and uh, but we have to get to the centennial uh, before we can really experience that that future, bright future that we have ahead of us. And now that our mayor, who, who was very courageous, you know, uh, many people think I'm, think I'm uh, critical of him. He's the most courageous mayor we ever had. He has uh, decided to lead the effort to search for the mass graves. And that right there could bring some type of uh, 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 solace to, to the situation. There's a, a mirror of hope that there will be some type of conciliation. And what I mean by that is, uh, we just look at the fundraising efforts they're, they're already having success with. Um, but a lot of people in the community, uh, they see hope, but what they really want to see is uh, our community to kind of preserve this, these historic buildings that we have here. And to them, if it becomes historical, to them, they feel like it will be around forever, right? And not just, you, you won't just focus on that vapor of tragedy. I want to see, you know, uh, a better Tulsa. You know, the Tulsa that I grew up in is not the Tulsa that we live in now. Uh, the America that I grew up in is not the America that we live in now. From a journalistic standpoint, um, you know, we had canceled Juneteenth, and then, you know, all of a sudden when President uh, 45 said he was coming, uh, you know, we kind of wanted to, okay, well, we got to, you know, do something. We didn't understand why it was on that historic, you know, uh, date from an African-American perspective um, because of the challenges that, you know, we uh, face now in America, in America now, not America 10 years ago, but America now. It's very different from what it was 10 years ago. As long as we uh, make sure that we include all people, as long as all lives matter um, in, on Greenwood, um, as long as, you know, we have viable entities here and people spend here, uh, you know, you can't say, okay, we built those nice buildings and they got all those nice places down there. Now I'm not going to go down there and eat. I'm not going to go down there and buy clothes. I'm not going to go down there. Uh, there's some IT guys that's drafting um, down here. There's, you know, doctors down here. But we have to uh, get people who will come here and spend those dollars, um, keep those businesses going um, so that we can create generational wealth for you know our families our kids our grandkids and i think that's the key you know um, i wasn't born a trust fund baby but i like to leave my grandkids a trust we are sitting on sacred grounds we are sitting on where the massacre took place. We're sitting on the grounds of Booker T. Washington High School. We have the Ellis Walker Memorial to demonstrate that. So not only are we building our community with North Tulsa, we want to build our community and be a part of the growth in the Greenwood District. A lot of uh, students are not aware of the history of this area. So that's why we offer many classes, even to community, to educate them on what transpired back in 1921. We held a class, a Black Wall Street class, and the majority of those were community who wanted to know more about Greenwood, the history of Greenwood. So now students are hungry for more. The community is hungry for more. And it's our duty to provide that education for them. Me representing this district and the history of Black Wall Street and the, the, the massacre and, and the emotion of it uh, was incumbent upon me to, to do something uh, because nothing had happened in nearly 20 years uh, in relation to Black Wall Street, our culture, uh, and no public funding for the Greenwood Cultural Center. And so I, I formed a commission to address the issue, to tell that story. And that evolved uh, even past just the Greenwood Cultural Center to uh, 
an opportunity to tell the story itself. And uh, we started uh, with uh, working with the Greenwood Cultural Center. And as we evolved, we ended up having our own uh, Greenwood Rising History Center that will now be located at Greenwood and Archer. And that is so important to the people here to tell their side of the story. I was part of a group that was commissioned by the state of Oklahoma to uh, build or create a memorial to the 1921 race massacre, uh, which was a recommendation by another group of folk that were commissioned with the responsibility of determining, researching uh, culpability uh, for the massacre. One of the recommendations given to the state was to create a memorial to the 1921 race massacre. And once we finished our work, um, our idea or our recommendation was to create this park. The state then uh, took our work, appropriated funds to develop this park. Uh, we created an organization, formed a 501c3, began the work of developing this park. Well, in developing the park, what we ran into we were one of the casualties of budget cuts. Most of the feedback we got was, uh, who, who wants to memorialize a tragedy? Uh, that's, that's something that's happened 80 years ago, and so let's just move on, let's just get over it. Well, my comeback to that kind of response was, you know, it's interesting that uh, someone wanted to memorialize the bombing of a building that devastated property, destroyed property, uh, lives were lost. What's the difference? As Secretary of Tourism, in my role uh, here in the state of Oklahoma, you know, one of the, the biggest assets that we have in the state is the Greenwood District. Uh, it's, it's one of the areas of our state that is talked about uh, more, than, more than most any other part of our state. When people are calling into the city of Tulsa or visiting the state of Oklahoma, it's the Greenwood District. They want to figure out how they get to Black Wall Street. Uh, and so as Secretary of Tourism, you know, what we are doing right now in the state of Oklahoma is making sure that people know across the world about Greenwood, about Black, Black Wall Street, and making sure they know about the Race Massacre Centennial. You know, what the, uh, what the bombing memorial did for Oklahoma City. Uh, and bringing, rallying that city together, and really rallying the state together. But what that, that museum in downtown Oklahoma City is really the heartbeat of the city now. Uh, and I truly believe that what we're building here in Greenwood and the Race Massacre Museum is going to be the heartbeat of this city. And it's really gonna be a pilgrimage type of experience for people all across the world, all across America, to come to Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, and to learn. Uh, so that the past is not repeated, uh, but be, but also to teach, you know, to teach Americans uh, ab about, listen, about building world-class city, about entrepreneurship, uh, and to make sure that, that what, what happened 100 years ago never happens again. How can I say that? This is kind of easing the tension in a community that's been balled up for 99 years. This is kind of showing them that, hey, we can do it again. Might not have 600 businesses, but we have 100. You see, we gotta not stereotype and be so small, but we need all of Tulsa, and we need to treat each other right. And if the Lord's not pleased with us, that's how we got a plague now. We need to treat each other right, stop killing each other, stop mistreating each other, stop backbiting and lying about things. One of the reasons that we still see issues around Black Lives Matter, mass incarceration, all the kind of social issues that are uh, evident right now is because we haven't adequately dealt with our, our history. Uh, these things come in fits and starts and we have been uh, remiss, I would say, in terms of addressing the wounds that exist from historical racial trauma. If we don't learn how to love each other we will never have nothing because if we all fall, if one said fall, we go all fall. Because it's a circle. Life is a circle. You know, you can't just go 180 degrees and stop. If I can make a difference somehow, OSU make a difference. 
you know, and getting the message out, conveying the importance, you know, of being on sacred ground, honoring the past, but again, looking forward to a better and more positive future. Tulsa has so much potential. Oklahoma has so much potential and an opportunity to show the world how to resolve, how to address issues of race. How awesome would it be if Tulsa could show Ferguson, or Tulsa could show Louisville, Kentucky, or Tulsa could show uh, Minnesota, how you as a community respond to racial tension and unrest and, and inequity? How, how, how best to do that? The world is waiting for Tulsa. I knew on a sort of an intellectual level, I guess you'd say, I knew in my brain that, uh, you know, in the 1920s, there was, there was uh, segregation and, and uh, racism. But, it, but I, didn't really, it, it, I didn't really understand it until I got involved in, in reading all these old newspapers and stuff. And it's not just about the massacre, it's about all the, you know, thousands of daily indignities that people went through during that, went through during that period. Uh, but then I, it, it also brought home to me just how almost everything in life is about money and power. Whether it's, you know, who gets to control the remote control at home or who decides, you know, who gets what. Uh, it's, it's about money and power, and to a large extent, that's, you know, that was about money and power. It was about asserting control over this, this group of people. I mean, it was, so, you know, I, I mean, I, what I think happened with the destruction of Greenwood is, you had a bunch of white people who said, we don't care how big you think you are, or how successful you are, or how much money you have, we can take it away in an instant. And they went down and did it. Never gonna lose the sound, I'm never gonna forget the beat. Cause I'm addicted to the melody, I've got rhythm in my feet. But when I've lost the plot and I've forgotten every part, I know you'll be right here waiting for the ride right back to the start. Would you be dancing in the street? gonna turn around cause you never turn your back on me I'm delivered by the remedy I've been singing in my sleep but when I feel the stripes and I've forgotten every part I know you'll be right here waiting if I go right back to the start uh, there should be dancing in the street find a melody we can repeat there will be a song from every girl and boy And it'll sound like joy There will be dancing in the street Find a melody you can repeat There will be a song from every girl and boy And it'll sound like joy And it'll sound like joy And it'll sound like It'll sound like It'll sound like It'll sound like joy I'm the street Sound like joy, and down to my feet will sound like joy. He can't compete with sounds of joy. Voices repeat and sound like joy. Out in the street will sound like joy. Down to my feet will sound like joy. He can't compete with sounds of joy. Down to the voices sing like joy. <laughs> 